Everybody, welcome to today's uh, Acid Base seminar. I thought what I would do today is uh, give a quiz, and that way you can sort of start gauging um, what your defects are and what you know and don't know. So each of these will be a case with a question as to what the acid base diagnosis is. So if all of you could uh, commit on paper what you think the diagnosis is, and then once you've all written down what you think, we'll discuss it. So this is the first case. It's a 27-year-old female who was admitted with a three-month history of shortness of breath and polyuria. And she was lethargic on physical exam with a low systolic pressure and tachycardia, flat JVP. Lung fields were clear, and she had no edema. And these are her uh, numbers. So if once you look at those numbers, um, come up with the what you think is the correct acid-based diagnosis. I'll give you a few minutes. For now, we'll, we'll just focus on accuracy, but eventually you want to get faster and faster at it uh, so that you can speed through these, hopefully, on your renal boards. And we're not focusing on the on the clinical diagnosis, although that's important. In other words, you have to separate the diagnosis of the abnormal chemistry from what the ca the clinical cause of that abnormal chemistry is. This will be uh, today essentially focusing on what the what the pattern of the uh, acid base numbers is is giving you as far as a diagnosis. Okay, so how's everybody uh, doing? Maybe everybody on mute today, just so we can we can know how everybody's doing. Is everyone done with the question, or did you still need more time? I'm done with the question. Okay. Is everybody else done? Because what I'd like you to do is to each commit to what you wrote. So why why don't we just go through everybody? Um, who who wants to start telling me what they think the diagnosis is? I'll start. Um, an elevated gap uh, metabolic acidosis with a uh, respiratory alkalosis. Okay, so you think there's a, a, a metabolic acidosis of the anion gap type, uh, and you you said that there's a respiratory acidosis, did you say, sorry, or alkalosis? You said respiratory alkalosis, right? Alkalosis, yeah. Alkalosis, yes. So remember, yes. when you're saying that, you're saying that the, the compensation, in other words, the ventilation is greater than you would predict for just the compensation. Is that what others think? Or oh, the PCO no. down appropriately? No, uh, or I'll ask you, Yesha, since you're since you were brave enough to no. give the answer first. So yeah. when you respiratory no, PCO2 is down appropriately. No, I didn't I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's a very important point that and it brings up this concept that the the expected compensation is not called a respiratory alkalosis. 
even though the PCO2 is decreased below normal in an absolute sense, that's what's expected to occur when you have a metabolic acidosis. So we don't call the fall on the PCO2 a respiratory alkalosis. And this is the key, key point. We only call it a respiratory alkalosis if it's below what's expected. And conversely, if it's above what's expected, we call that a respiratory acidosis, even if the PCO2 is below 40. So even if it's below normal, let's say it's a male, this is a female, so it's not going to start at 40. Let's say the PCO2 in this context here was 34. If it's supposed to be, let's say 28, then you then the 34 is called a respiratory acidosis, even though it's below 40. So when you have a metabolic acidosis and also not shown here a metabolic alkalosis, the compensation becomes your new norm. That's the key point. And everything above that, even if it's below 40 or below 38 in a female, anything above the expected number is called a respiratory acidosis, even if it's below 38 or 40. And everything below the expected is called a respiratory alkalosis. But the expected, which we call just appropriate compensation, is not called a respiratory alkalosis, even though it's below 40. So below 40 in a male, in the context of a metabolic acidosis, can be respiratory acidosis, a normal compensation, or a respiratory alkalosis, depending on whether the PCO2 is what you expect or not expect. So the question then is, what do you expect the PCO2 to be? as a compensation in a metabolic acidosis. Does anyone remember the, the acid-base rule? I think it's uh, <clears throat> for uh, every one of this uh, total CO2 under normal, we uh, it's 0 0.7. So let's say like she's a female, normal is 22, 23. So that's uh, eight and then eight times 0 0.7, that's 5.6. So it would be like around, so the PCO2 now is 28, but with that would be 34. So if 34 is normal for a female, then there's no, uh, then it's well compensated. Yeah. So Christian, that's actually for metabolic alkalosis. So in a metabolic oh, okay. alkalosis yeah. for every, for every, let's say 10 increase in the bicarbonate, the PCO2, you get a compensation, you decrease your ventilation such that the PCO2 goes up seven tenths or 70% of what the bicarbonate went up. In a metabolic acidosis, the change in both is about equal. So if the bicarbonate fell by 10, the PCO2 should fall from its original level by about 10. So the rule for metabolic, or you can use the Winters formula if you want to, but it's obviously a more complicated way to remember it. So in metabolic acidosis, for every decrease in the bicarbonate, no matter what it's caused by, whether it's gap or non-gap, it doesn't matter. Your medulla senses that and changes your ventilation such that, such that the PCO2 falls the same amount. And if it does, that's what you call a normal compensation. You don't, you don't use the term respiratory alkalosis because when you're saying respiratory alkalosis or acidosis, you're saying there's abnormality. You're also inferring that, that there's another disease process that's occurring. We don't call the compensation a disease process. That's why we don't use the term respiratory alkalosis, even though it's below normal, because we don't want to give the impression that there's ab abnormal medulla function. So we the term evolved to just call that normal compensation, even though in a logical sense, it is a respiratory alkalosis, but we don't use that term because we only use the term respiratory alkalosis when we're inferring abnormality or abnormal medullary brain stem function. So the problem always is to know whether the fall is what you'd expect. You need to know the original numbers. We don't know the original bicarbonate. We don't know the original PCO2. 
but we have to assume population norms. And so in, in a 27 year old female, the normal bicarbonate would be 23, maybe 24, would not be 25, that would already be high. And the PCO2 would start off around 38 or so. So you can see that the change in both the bicarb fell, we are guessing because we don't know the original number, but we're guessing it fell by about 10, nine or 10. And the PCO2 fell by the same amount. So this is what on an exam you would say is a, an appropriately compensated metabolic acidosis. And once you've diagnosed that, you then see whether the anion gap's elevated or not. And we don't use the word technically elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. We just use the term anion gap. When, when you say anion gap, I mean, technically you should say elevated, but it's just not what people use. The, the correct terminology would be this is an anion gap type metabolic acidosis. And then, of course, it has a whole differential, which we won't go into today. In this particular patient, it's likely ketoacidosis. Okay, so this is a simple acid base disorder. It's an anion gap type. On an exam, you would write this is an anion gap type metabolic acidosis that's appropriately compensated. Okay, take some time and uh, write down what you think is going on with this with this patient. So it's a patient with a month-long history of diarrhea who was uh, semi-conscious with a low systolic pressure and tachycardia again, and again, a flat JVP. So again, the patient has other things going on clearly, but we won't discuss those today. Obviously the patient's dysnatremic and hypokalemic. And these aren't tricky questions. They're all, for the most part, simple acid-based disorders. But to know whether they're simple or not, and to be able to make the right diagnosis, you have to know what the change in the PCO2 and the bicarbonate are for every one of the cardinal acid-based disorders, metabolic acidosis, acute and chronic respiratory alkalosis, and then the diseases that raise the, or the disorders that raise the bicarbonate metabolic alkalosis or acute or chronic respiratory acidosis. You have to know the change in PCO2 to change in bicarbonate for each of those. And then you just see which your particular patient fits into. Yeah, let's take another minute and then uh, open it up for what you think is going on. But everybody should commit on paper so that you can then see whether you got it right or not. And if anyone has questions about the thinking when we discuss these, please, please unmute your mic and let me know. There are clinical clues here too, but you shouldn't use the clinical clue, at least initially, to make the diagnosis. It should be strictly based on the numbers. And again, as you recognize, we're not looking at the pH. Don't look at the pH to make the diagnosis. You don't need it. And also, if you do, you're going to make mistakes. Just the PCO2 and the bicarbonate. Or if you want to, you can look at the total CO2. But as you can see, the total CO2 is always only about 1, 1 1.5 millimoles per liter higher than the bicarbonate anyway. So it's not you're not getting any different information, typically. There are situations 
where those numbers aren't the same. But those are rare and we won't have any of those today. But in general, if you have a blood gas, you just look at all, the, you just look at the PCO2 and bicarbonate from the blood gas, you don't need to look at the total CO2. Okay, so does someone else want to unmute and tell me what they think is going on? Non-GAP metabolic acidosis um, with a normal respiratory response. Yes, yeah, so that's correct. So the, the terminology would be a non-GAP metabolic uh, acidosis with appropriate compensation. That, that's what typically you'd find on the exam. If the wording is different, um, so be it. But what you're, you're, that's correct. So what you're saying is that the bicarbonate fell due to some disease process that didn't raise the anion gap. The medulla recognized that and increased the ventilation such that there was a discrepancy. What happens is there's a discrepancy between the carbon dioxide that's produced by your mitochondria and the amount of carbon dioxide you're getting rid of via the lungs. And so the PCO2 falls because the output exceeds the input until a new steady state is reached. And you are correct. The, the fall on the bicarbonate is roughly equal to the fall on the PCO2. Again, we're assuming population norms. We don't know what the original numbers were, but we're assuming 40 and 25 because it's, it, it's a male. If you have original numbers from your patient, that's great. You can use those instead. And uh, so that's it. And we divide up uh, the non-GAP metabolic acidoses into whether they're hyperkalemic or not. This happens to be the hypokalemic variety. Diarrhea is the most common cause of a non-GAP metabolic acidosis that you'll see clinically. And there's, you know, it can also cause dysnatremia and also hypokalemia and some pre-renal um, AKI. So that's that's what's going on with the BUN and creatinine. Yes, yeah, so that's that's the correct answer. So here's another patient, a 60-year-old male with a four-year history of a cough, shortness of breath, uh, who had difficulty breathing, and he was the cough was productive of green sputum. The patient was mildly cyanotic. Uh, blood pressure was normal, though we don't know the original blood pressure. He might have been hypertensive. Uh, again, tachycardic, increased respiratory rate, and uh, chest exam is noted. And so these are the numbers. Again, focus on what the acid-base diagnosis is. And remember, the approach to all these is the same. Don't look at the pH, look at the bicarbonate and decide, is it increased or decreased? If it's increased, it's either metabolic alkalosis or, or acute or chronic respiratory acidosis, those three. If it's decreased, it's either metabolic acidosis or acute or chronic respiratory alkalosis, the second group of three. So there's six choices always if it's a simple acid-base disorder. So by looking at the bicarbonate, you've ruled out half of the six. And again, as you can see here, the total CO2 is up also, um, reflecting the increase in the bicarbonate. Remember that the total CO2 is bicarbonate plus the dissolved carbon dioxide. And the dissolved carbon dioxide is 0.03 times your PCO2. And the PCO2 is elevated here at 70. So there's about 0.03 times 70 is about 2.1. So there's 2.1 millimoles per liter. Um, in, above the bicarbonate because of the PCO2, the carbon dioxide that's dissolved, and that gives you the 36. That's why there's about a two difference here compared to someone who has a PCO2 of 40. Or if, the, if in some of the patients we just showed the PCO2 was in the 20s, that the total CO2 and bicarbonate are even going to be closer together. 
there's, there's even less dissolved carbon dioxide. So the, in this case, there's more, which is why the delta or the total CO2 minus bicarbonate is, is more than about one. It's in this case higher. And another thing, an anecdote here you, is, is that you can see that whenever the total CO2 or bicarbonate goes up, the body decreases the chloride concentration by the same amount. If that didn't occur, you'd have a change in your anion gap. And it's not something we, we use clinically for anything. It's just of interest to note that there's always this inverse relationship between the two, unless you have changes in your anion gap, which means you have some other non-chloride, non-bicarbonate anion floating around, then the chloride won't change by the amount the bicarbonate changed. But if there's no other anion there, the chloride and the bicarbonate always change inversely. Okay, so let's take another minute and uh, we'll discuss this case. Okay, does anyone want to unmute and discuss what the acid based disorder is here? Nobody? Okay, well, make sure you write down what you think so that you can compare it to the answer. So, again, we have an elevated bicarbonate, so metabolic alkalosis, acute respiratory acidosis, or chronic respiratory acidosis. Which of the three it is, we look at the change in bicarbonate and compare it to the change in the PCO2 and see which of the three acid base rules it fits. If it's metabolic alkalosis causing the bicarb to go up, the PC, PCO2 should go up 70% of that. And obviously it didn't. PCO2 is up way more than 70% of 10. It should only have gone up by seven. It should be 47. So it cannot be a compensated metabolic alkalosis. And then we're left with acute respiratory acidosis or chronic respiratory acidosis. If it's acute respiratory acidosis raising the PCO2 from 40 to 72, that's a change of 30, 32 or so. For every 10 increase in the PCO2 acutely, the bicarbonate goes up about one, one to two, 1 1.5 or so. And obviously that didn't occur here. The bicarbonate went up by, by 10, nine or 10. So if it's a simple acid-based disorder, just by default, since we've excluded the first two causes, we're only left with the last one, which is a chronic respiratory acidosis. And then we'll check and see whether that's occurring or not. The rule there is that for every 10 increase in the PCO2, the bicarbonate goes up 3.3 or 3.5. And you can see that's what occurred here. So these numbers are compatible with a chronic respiratory acidosis, which means the patient has been hypo ventilating for at least four or five days. The most common cause, now if you want to think of what the causes are, you're left usually with chronic, chronic lung disease, which is divided up, if you don't know the acid base status into chronic bronchitis or emphysema, just a classic medical student type of categorization. They have different acid base disorders. The chronic bronchitic patient has a chronic respiratory acidosis, and the emphysematous patient is hyperventilating and has a chronic respiratory alkalosis. So if you didn't have a chest X-ray or have any clinical history, you would predict based on just the acid-based numbers that the patient, if you were told, has chronic lung disease, that it's chronic bronchitis. Emphysema would not lead to these numbers. Now, obviously, you don't have these extremes in every patient. You can have mixtures of both, and then it gets more complicated. 
the the other question is the mechanism of the hypoxia remember you have two major reasons just conceptually either you have a lower po2 in your alveoli without anything else going on obviously the po2 in the blood's going to be lower than normal just because you started off with a lower po2 in your lungs so to calculate what the and the normal difference is about 10 the po2 in your alveoli is not exactly equal to the PO2 in the blood, it's about 10 lower, which is called the AA gradient. So that also helps tell whether you're going to find something on chest X-ray, whether you have a normal AA gradient or not. In chronic bronchitis, the AA gradient is normal. You don't have any parench in the strict chronic bronchitis. You don't have any alveolar or small parench parenchymal lung disease, whereas the emphysematous patient, they actually have a higher PO2 in the alveoli but their A gradient is sky high because they have parenchymal lung disease. And that's why for, even though they have a higher than normal alveolar PO2, they, they're hypoxemic. So the question is, how do you calculate the PO2 in the alveolus to differentiate the cause of the hypoxemia? And that the equation is 150 minus five quarters of your PCO2, assuming you don't have any, you don't have any oxygen mask and you're at sea, you know, you're at sea level with normal barometric pressure and the atmosphere is hydrated with water. If you do the math, you calculate that the PO2 in the inspired air is 150 millimeters of mercury. And in the alveoli, it's not exactly equal to what it, what it is in the air because you've got other gases in the alveolus. So it's mainly carbon dioxide. It's 150 minus five quarters of the PCO2. So you, you take that, 150, multiply 72 times five quarters, and that will tell you what the PO2 is in the alveolus. Does anyone have a calculator and could do that now? So it's 150, assuming you're breathing room air, minus five quarters of 72. What, what's that? Anybody have a calculator? Can you say that again? It was 150 yeah. minus 5.72. So, so if someone says to you, what is the PO2 in the alveoli of my patient? The answer is 150 minus five quarters of your PCO2. The 150 assumes you're breathing room air, that the percent oxygen is 21%. So 150 minus... So I guess 60 yeah, that's that's that sounds right. So that so in this particular patient, and that's why the patient patient with chronic bronchitis is 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 hypoxemic. The PO two in their alveoli, in this particular patient, and in anyone who's hypoventilating, is lower than normal because the PCO two is going up, and then that decreases the PO two in the alveoli. So, the, so the PO two in the, the the highest PO two this patient could have is 10 less than the PO2 in the alveolus. The normal A gradient is always about 10. So assuming the, the that that is going on, we have no reason not to think that, unless the patient has parenchymal lung disease uh, or a shunt or something, an AV shunt, uh, or a VQ abnormality mismatch, then the A gradient should be 10. So all you need to know is what the, the P, PO2 is in the alveolus, and you can predict what the PO2 in the blood must be without measuring it. Assuming you know the A gradient is normal, obviously. What If you know the PO2 in the, in the blood and you've calculated the alveolus and it's 60, that's how we get, then, then you can just calculate the, the A gradient. But it isn't just the fact of calculating it. When you see a normal A gradient, you know you're not going to see any parenchymal lung disease on the chest x-ray. So this is sort of the extreme chronic bronchitis, just hypoventilation, nothing going on in the, in the alveoli or in the parenchyma. What is the normal PO2 in the alveoli? It's 150 minus five quarters of 40, which is 100, right? So you have a P, PO2 in your alveoli of 100. You're, the, the highest PO2 you can have in your blood is 90, right? There's always a 10 difference, roughly. 10 difference. So, so it's very important when you have uh, respiratory acidosis to also calculate your A gradient. It will always lead to hypoxemia. It has to, because when the PCO2 goes up, 
you get a commensurate decrease de in your alveolar PO2. So it's just something that's sort of pleasing intellectually to think about. And also, instead of just looking at the numbers and not thinking further, you can actually infer a lot of things about what's going on in the lung without doing a chest x-ray or having the chest x-ray back. Uh, and you can explain to the students and the residents why the patient's hypoxemic. The emphysematous patient would have a PCO2 of 25. And then when you take the 150 minus five quarters of 25, as an example, you're going to see the PO2 is above 100 in the LVLI, 120, 130, whatever, whatever it comes out to. And if the PO2 in the blood is 50, that's a sky high A gradient. So the, the low LV, the, a low alveolar PO2 does not account for hypoxemia in an emphysematous patient. And in fact, it's paradoxical. They have a higher PO2 in the alveoli than normal, as does someone who's uh, a woman who's pregnant with chronic respiratory alkalosis or uh, a cirrhotic patient with chronic respiratory alkalosis. All those folks have a higher PO2, like an emphysematous patient, in their alveoli except that the pregnant woman and the cirrhotic patient won't be hypoxemic because they don't have an abnormal, they don't have parenchymal lung disease like the emphysematous patient does. But all three have a higher PO2 in their alveoli than normal. Okay, here's another case. Why don't you take some time and commit to what the acid-based diagnosis is? So it's a 58-year-old male who was admitted with a one week history of nausea and vomiting, and uh, was in moderate distress, you know, vomiting, bilious fluid, blood pressure was normal, but decreased uh, upright, so some postural hypotension. And uh, patient had a tachycardia that went up even higher upright, and some right upper quadrant findings. And so here are the numbers. Again, the patient has dysnatremia, hypokalemia likely some AKI pre-renal from the vomiting, but don't focus on that, just the acid-base numbers. What is the acid-base diagnosis? And again, try to commit to what you think by writing it down. You can see here also the total CO2 more closely approximates the bicarbonate because the PCO2 isn't sky high elevated like the other patients. So the dissolved carbon dioxide is 0 0.03 times 47, which is about 1.4, 1.5. And these total CO2 and bicarbonate values are rounded off from the clinical lab. They could give you a decimal point reading, but they typically don't. Set of metabolic alkalosis with maybe also a respiratory alkalosis because the uh, PCO2 is uh, lower than we'd expect it to be. Okay, so again, we have an elevated bicarbonate. So it's either metabolic alkalosis, acute respiratory acidosis, or chronic respiratory acidosis. So we'll first see if it's a metabolic alkalosis. And what we do is look at the increase in the bicarbonate above normal. Again, we assume 25. And then we compare that to the change in the PCO2. And here you can see that the PCO2 went up as expected in a metabolic alkalosis. So the direction of the numbers are correct. The question is, is the change in the PCO2 above normal what you would predict? And the rule is 7 tenths, so 70%. So if the bicarbonate increased by 10, the PCO2 should go up from its original value by seven. And you can see here that fits. So this, the, the correct diagnosis here, it is a metabolic alkalosis, as you said, but 
as far as what the PCO2 is, it's appropriate compensation. It's not a respiratory acidosis, even though it's above 40, because we don't call the expected number respiratory acidosis. If it was above 47, then the patient would have a mixed disorder of metabolic alkalosis and a respiratory acidosis. Or if it was below 47, 44, 43, 42, we would call that a respiratory alkalosis. And don't let that confuse you. It, 47 becomes the new normal, not 40. So anything below 47 is a respiratory alkalosis. Same thinking as we talked about with the metabolic acidosis. So we don't need to check, could this be acute respiratory acidosis or chronic respiratory acidosis as a reason for the elevated bicarbonate? Because we, with the first hypothesis that we were testing, is this a metabolic alkalosis? The numbers fit perfectly. So we don't need, then, then, then by definition, they can't fit the remaining two possibilities for an elevated bicarbonate. So this, the, the, so the correct answer on the exam would be a compensated metabolic alkalosis. Now, on the exam, they may say, in addition, what the urine chloride was, because as soon as you have that, we don't divide up metabolic alkalosis by anion gap, but we divide it up by whether it's chloride responsive or not. And to tell whether it's chloride responsive or not, we don't bother giving chloride containing salts we look at the urine chloride concentration and if it's low or the chloride to creatinine ratio or the fractional excretion of chloride, we look at the concentrate, we look at that number and if it's low, lower than normal, then we predict it will respond to chloride. And in this particular case, you would expect the, those, those measurements to be lower than normal and therefore predicting that if you gave chloride in the form of sodium chloride, or any other chloride containing salt, um, not ammonium chloride, but uh, potassium chloride or other chloride containing salts, it's the chloride that's important. That's why I'm emphasizing that. The metabolic alkalosis would go away, the bicarbonate would go down to 25. Whereas if the chloride in the urine is normal, the fractional excretion or the chloride to creatinine ratio is what yours would be on the same chloride intake. And I'm emphasizing normal, not higher than normal and you don't call it high, you just say that it's normal, you can give as much chloride as you want and they'll just pee it out like you would and the bicarbonate will stay at 35. So we won't get into that for this case, but clinically you would predict if they asked you, is it, would this be predicted to be chloride responsive or another way of saying it chloride sensitive? The answer would be yes, you would predict it would be chloride sensitive. So here's another case. Uh, it's a 25-year-old male with a two-week history of sniffing glue. And here are the numbers. And of note also, the urine anion gap was positive. Although the, it's, it's not a, a great number to assess. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. And the urine osmolar gap was 150. Those can be ignored for now. They're sort of secondary questions to what we're trying to achieve today. So this is a hard one. So the, the answer is there. It's a non-GAP metabolic. The, the acid-base diagnosis is, 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 is not hard here. Again, we have the same sort of thing. We have a drop in the bicarbonate from normal. So it's either metabolic acidosis, acute respiratory alkalosis, or chronic respiratory alkalosis. Which of the three? We look at the change in bicarbon change in PCO2. And you can see they're both about the same. The fall is both roughly the same for each. So that's compatible with a compensated metabolic acidosis. We don't call the 28 respiratory alkalosis because it's what we would expect to occur, only if it's below 28. And in addition, if it was above 28, even though it's below 40, we call that a respiratory acidosis. So if it was 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, we call that respiratory acidosis. Don't get confused. You might say, you know, many people say, how can you call 34 respiratory acidosis? Only things above 40 should be respiratory acidosis. But the point is 28 is the physiologic new PCO2 in this condition. And that's your new set point. For, for using the terminology 
is there respiratory acidosis? Because you aren't just making, as I said, a chemical diagnosis, you're telling another doctor that there's an abnormality with a medulla. And if it's 28, there is no abnormality. So we don't use the word respiratory acidosis. But if it's above 28, there is an abnormality with the medulla. It's not increasing the carbon dioxide. It's not increasing the ventilation sufficiently to get rid of the carbon dioxide that a normal human would typically get rid of when their bicarbonate was dropped to 14. The response is to hyperventilate and it's quantitatively predictable. That's the beauty of doing this. It's not a random response. All humans respond on average the exact same way. And that's how we get the acid base rules. So this is a metabolic acidosis compensated with a normal anion gap. So a non-gap metabolic acidosis or some people say hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. That's just, it is saying the same thing and it doesn't matter which way you say it. And it gets back to the point that typically, unless you have other anions floating around, the fall in the bicarbonate is equal to the increase in the chloride. So the, 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 that's why you're able to maintain electron, it's called the maintenance of electron neutrality. You can't have the bicarbonate falling without something happening electrically to keep the blood electroneutral. Either chloride has to go up or an anion like, like ketone body or lactate has to go up by the same amount. Or sodium or potassium have to go up by the same amount. But something has to occur. You can't just have one anion, one ion changing alone. It doesn't occur physiologically. Okay, so... This is a non-GAP or hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. And typically we would look, or often we would look and see what the ammonia concentration is in the urine. Now for the first time since UCLA was created in the last year, we can measure the urine ammonium directly. It took 30 years to get that to occur, but now we can measure it. So these, at least at UCLA for your fellowship, these are not needed. But in most places, you can't measure the urine ammonium. So these two uh, measurements evolved over the years as an indirect assessment of what the urine ammonium is. The most ac the more accurate one is the urine osmolar gap divided by two. So you calculate the urine uh, osmolar gap by including the urea and, and the glucose. You add two times plus two times the sodium plus potassium, and that gives you the calculated osmol concentration in the urine, and then you measure it and subtract the two. And the normal is around 50 to 100, something like that. So this is elevated. But the reason for doing this is when you take that gap and divide by two, that's um, unless there's other things going on, which we won't discuss today, that's equal to the or close to the ammonium concentration without measuring it. Divide the gap by two. The other way to do it is to is to qualitatively do it by looking at the urine anion gap. And it's usually minus 20 uh, to plus 20. And the more ammonium in the urine, the more negative it becomes, the less ammonia in the urine. So the problem is the urine anion gap is equal to the unmeasured anions in the urine. So the non-chloride, non-bicarbonate anions minus the unmeasured cations. And the unmeasured cations is ammonium, essentially. The problem is the urine anion gap can become more positive two ways. You could have more unmeasured anions in the urine, or you could have less ammonia in the urine. And that's a problem with glue sniffing, which is sniffing toluene. Uh, toluene is metabolized into hippuric acid. And the proton causes the metabolic acidosis by binding bicarbonate, but it affects the urine anion gap by increasing the unmeasured anions in the urine. The hit purate is, is, is filtered and excreted easily. And to the extent that you have more and more hit purate in the urine, the urine anion gap is going to become more positive because remember, it's the unmeasured anions minus the unmeasured cations. And you would falsely interpret that to say that there's little ammonia in the urine. 
because typically when the urine anion gap becomes more positive, it's not due to unmeasured anions going up, it's due to unmeasured cations going down. And in fact, this patient is complicated because there's hip urate in the urine, raising the urine anion gap, but the urine osmolal gap also tells us that there's more ammonia in the urine, because if we divide that 150 by 75, that's more than you would find typically. The urine ammonium on an average North American diet is around 30, 40, maybe 50 at the most, but not 75. Here, it's 75 because of the metabolic acidosis. Remember, metabolic acidosis increases the proximal tubule ammonium production and through a series of things that occurs as far as transfer of ammonia in the different nephron segments, you end up with more in the urine also. So the reason the urine anion gap became more positive and not more negative, it would be more negative if, it was, if there was just more uh, ammonia in the urine because the unmeasured cations would go up. It's just that the hip urate went up more than the ammonia went up. So when you subtract the two, you end up with a positive urine anion gap. So this is a type of question they could give you uh, because it's paradoxical in that the urine anion gap went up despite the fact that you have more ammonia in the urine as reflected by the urine osmolal gap. So it's a complicated uh, question in that sense. So glue sniffing, remember it makes, or it, it can, glue can, the glue sniffing they'll be talking about will be from toluene and uh, it's metabolized into hippuric acid. So here's another case. It's a 52 year old female admitted with a three month history of weight loss and lethargy. She had metastatic breast uh, CA and uh, her vitals are as shown. JVP was uh, six centimeters above the sternal angle, not much on exam. She had a liver mass and uh, she got some chemo. Iphosphamide was given to her and these are her numbers. Total CO2, eight, bicarbonate, seven. This is somewhat an issue of memory because if you know what iphosphamide does to your acid base numbers then you can look for it in the numbers and if you don't know then you just follow the typical route of diagnosis the bicarbonate's down here so it's one of three things metabolic acidosis acute respiratory alkalosis or chronic respiratory alkalosis so look at those numbers and uh Tell me which of the three you think the numbers fit the best. Again, don't look at the pH. And again, there's nothing fancy here. These are all simple acid-base disorders. S not simple in the sense that they're easy to figure out, but simple meaning there's only one disorder. That's what the, that's what the term in the, in the context of acid-base diagnosis means. When people say it's a simple acid-base disorder, it means there's only one acid-base disorder present, as opposed to it being a complex acid-base disorder, which means there's more than one. It doesn't mean that the complexity of figuring this out is any less or any more. So those are sort of funny terms that have evolved in English. Let me take maybe another few seconds and then we'll open up the floor to anyone who wants to venture as to what's going on. And again, the thinking just repeats, repeats, repeats over and over again. It's just a matter of practicing and doing these over and over and over and over again. There's, there's really no new thinking. As a, as a baseline, you have to know the acid-base disorders, and you approach each patient the same by looking at whether the bicarbonate's elevated or decreased. And then it becomes, after a while, just pretty much rote. <laughs> 
Okay, does anyone want to reflect what's going on here? Okay, we'll make sure you write down what you think is going on so you can compare your answer. So again, the bicarbonate's down. It can only be a metabolic acidosis or acute respiratory alkalosis or chronic respiratory alkalosis. Which of the three? We look at the changes from normality for the bicarb and the PCO2. The bicarb fell probably by 17. We don't know exactly. It's a female, 16, 17. And the PCO2 fell by about the same amount. So this is a compensated metabolic acidosis. Again, we don't call the drop in the PCO2 a respiratory alkalosis. We would only do that if it was below 23. And, you know, we're not talking about one. If it was 22, you wouldn't make an issue of it. But if it's 20, 19, 18, 17, we would call that a respiratory alkalosis, telling another doctor that the PCO2 fell too much. There's too much ventilation we would expect it should be 23 in a normal human being. And again, if it's 26, 28, 30, 31, 36, 37, the patient has a respiratory acidosis in addition because it's above the 23. But these numbers are exactly what you would predict for someone who's just got a compensated metabolic acidosis. And then we look at the anion gap and it's normal. So this is a non-gap or hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, you can see that the, again, the chloride goes up by what the bicarb fell so that we maintain electric neutrality. There's no other anions floating around. The only anion that can change is chloride. So there's, it, there's no ele elevation of the anion gap. And the question is, what's going on? Does anyone know what iphosphamide does in the nephron? Anybody? This you'll need to know on your exam, potentially. Iphosamide is, is one of the medical causes or pharmacologic causes of proximal RTA. It inhibits proximal tubule bicarbonate transport. So this is, as far as the medical diagnosis, this is, this is type 2 RTA. And we'll give you a different talk at a later date on, our, on how to approach the RTAs, but... But so, but ifosamide block, it does a number of things in the nephron. It can cause hematuria, other things, but it blocks proximal tubule bicarbonate transport. And the bicarbonate just comes out in the urine. And typically, if you see a bicarbonate that's this low uh, and, it is, and you know it's proximal RTA, it's usually a drug. It, and as you see here, it's quite severe um, until a new steady state is reached. So the bicarbonate drops in the blood. And as it drops, there's less bicarbonate coming through all your glomeruli, and it'll drop until the proximal, the diseased proximal tubule from the ifosamide can handle that new, lo much lower load. So whatever the tubule can handle, that's when the bicarbonate will stop changing. And that will obviously vary depending on how much injury the proximal tubule incurred from the drug. So... This patient got, and as soon as you see that iphosphamide on a, on a test, your brain should immediately think of proximal RTA. Okay, so I think we'll, we'll stop there. I have more questions, but we'll do that um, next week. So does anyone have any questions? So again, I think it's important now to start committing on paper what you think is going on and compare that to uh, the correct answer. Make sure you you're cognizant of the terminology. That's going to be part of what you need to do here, and that's to rid your mind of the terminology that you might have been using or not using over the years so that you'll simplify your thinking to a few words that you'll you'll recognize when you when you have your exams because the terminology I'm giving you is what's going to be on the boards. Okay, everyone. So if there are no questions, have a have a have a great rest of the day. Enjoy your evening.